Uh, my name is Rob. I'm an engineer at Microsoft. Uh, and my role is I work with partners in the container space. Specifically, I work with them to enable them on the platform, to make them run more efficiently on Azure. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about building fast data solutions uh, with DCOS. Um, I'm going to show you on Azure. I'm not a sales guy. I don't hold any quotas, so I'm not going to be trying to sell Azure. But if you do choose to run on Azure, and there are a lot of good reasons to do so, I'll give you some tips on how to do that. Hopefully, you're familiar with what fast data is uh, in, in the SMAC stack. If you're not, I'll give you a very high-level overview. Um, fast data solutions are the typical IoT solutions, but there's a time cruciality uh, in, involved. And I'll give you a good example. I have a, a customer that I worked with that they have those gates that as you exit stores, if you haven't paid for an item, uh, they alarm. And the way those things work is they're little RF chips that they put in the tags on the whatever product you're looking to purchase. And as you exit, as you hit that sensor, the sensor determines the direction you're moving in. If it detects that you're moving towards the exit, towards you're leaving, uh, it sends an event uh, up to the cloud. And then some computations are done to see if you've purchased that product or not. And then if you haven't, an event gets back, sent back down to that sensor, and the sensor alarms. Now you can imagine. If that, uh, if that round trip took longer than, say, a couple hundred milliseconds, if it took, say, 20 seconds, that it would be valueless. Uh, the person would have already been, been in their car driving away with whatever they've uh, pinched, right? Um, so that's that time-sensitive nature. Now, there's not just one of, those, uh, one of those gates in the store. There's probably five or six per store. There may be a 1,000 stores, and there are a couple, you know, maybe a dozen people walking through any gate at any point in time. So that's hundreds of thousands of events that are going on per second. So that's kind of the IoT nature of fast data. Okay? The SMAC stack, you're likely very uh, familiar with. But Spark, Mesos, uh, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka. Spark is a distributed processing engine where you can do ML, uh, data processing. Uh, Mesos is the reason why we're all here. It uh, basically can act as a kernel for your uh, data center or a cluster of servers. Akka is, a, uh, is an actor-based uh, framework for building distributed applications. Cassandra is a linearly scalable uh, NoSQL database, and Kafka is a linearly scalable uh, event buffer. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about Mesos, Kafka, and Cassandra. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about DCOS around Mesos. Sessions, sessions demo driven, very demo. It's about half demo, half slides, live demos, could fail, all the, you know, hail to the demo gods, blah, blah, blah. So, because it's demo driven, I have to talk to you about the application I wrote for the demo. Okay? Imagine you have a bunch of sensors that are writing into Kafka. Now, I didn't want to create a bunch of instances of those sensors, so I, I created a, 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 something called a producer, which acts like it's a bunch of sensors. And it's writing to Kafka, specifically to a topic called sensor temp. Okay? Now, Kafka, uh, Kafka is, uh, is partitioned. Okay? And so depending upon the key for my event, it's going to get written to a specific partition. Okay? And the partitioning is why Kafka is linearly scalable. Okay? So I've got a, a, a consumer component that I wrote. And it subscribes to the topic as a whole. Okay? Now that consumer can be assigned to one or more of those partitions. Okay? When an event comes in on a partition that it's assigned to, I'm going to capture that event and I'm going to write some data into Cassandra. Make sense so far? Gets a little bit more complex, but not much more. Now, you remember I mentioned that a consumer can be assigned to one or more partitions. In fact, when I have one consumer, it's going to be assigned to all the partitions. Okay? But it's not going to read off all the partitions at once. So what it's going to do is it's going to be reading off of a partition, and it's going to get back a block of data, maybe 50 events, n number of events at a time. Okay? The interesting thing about Kafka, one of the challenges you'll find working with Kafka, is it doesn't really have this notion of how far behind am I on the queue as a whole, or on that topic as a whole. So you've seen things like queue depth. There's that, that concept doesn't really exist within Kafka. The way it works in Kafka is when I go to pull from a, pet, a partition, one of those end partitions, I get back some metadata along with those events. And that metadata tells me how far behind I am on that particular partition. Okay? So I may be just pulling from the first partition, and it says I'm 50 or 500 behind on that partition, but I have no notion of partitions 2 through x, how far behind I am. Okay? Make sense so far? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to handle that, because I want to know 
how to scale. I want to know how far behind I am on these uh, in my partition so I can scale my consumers. So what I decided to do is when I have a second consumer and that rebalance occurs, or n number of consumers, every time a consumer gets back that metadata saying how far it is behind on its partition, I basically write to another topic saying, hey, on partition one, I'm 500 behind. Another one may be writing, on partition three, I'm 50 behind. And then I've got another component that's listening off of that that calculates the aggregate. How far am I behind as a whole? Make sense? Now it's not altogether 100% accurate because as I mentioned, if you're not getting back data from partitions, if they're partitions that are unread, you're behind on them, but you don't know that. But we'll see how we can handle that a little bit later. Once we have that aggregate lag, once I know how far back behind I am on my, uh, on my uh, topic as a whole, I'm gonna write that to a workflow engine. And we're going to see what that looks like later. And we're going to use that workflow engine to auto scale out my consumers. Make sense? That's the scenario. So what I'm going to illustrate, I tend to think of con container-based solutions in, in layers, starting with just the containers themselves. What do containers buy for me? What do I get out of containers? And how do they help me, in this case, in the, in the context of this talk, build fast data solutions? So I'll start with that. We won't spend a ton of time on that. Then we're going to talk about running at scale. What's the, what do the orchestrator, specifically DCOS, give me when I'm building fast data solutions? And because these are persistent or stateful workloads, how do I handle data persistence? And I'm going to talk about using a, a product called Portworks to solve a lot of the challenges that you have when working with persistent workloads. And I'll outline what those challenges are. We'll talk about how Portworks is going to resolve those. And then I'm going to touch on some day two operations. How many of you guys have seen any of the talks that have dealt with VAMP? Several of you have. Um, they were talking about Canary releasing in VAMP. I'm going to be using VAMP to do microscaling. Um, so I'm going to use VAMP to build a workflow that's going to do uh, scaling, that's going to scale out given the lag that I'm showing from, uh, from Kafka. And that's about it. So let's jump into the local development aspect, just what containers do. And when we're talking about from the perspective of fast data solutions, prior to containers, how would, you, uh, how would you go about developing against Cassandra or Kafka? You'd have to either install it yourself or you'd have a shared solution, right? Um, and you'd, have a, you'd be sharing with other people a pooled solution, neither of which are very good solutions. Uh, installing it, wasted calories, very difficult to do, challenging. Um, and then using a pooled solution, other people can step on what you've got. They can delete your data, they can, uh, it, it, and it's not portable. You just can't run on your laptop if it's, if it's shared. If you're running on a plane, how does it work? Today, it's as easy as running a container up. Just spin up the container, develop against it. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Containers give you beyond just the ability to, uh, to run things like uh, Kafka or Cassandra. Uh, and, and to me, the, the attribute of a container that really gives you everything is the fact that it encapsulates its dependencies. That, that nature, that fact, makes sure that you know that something runs on your machine, it's going to run the same as it does in production, on dev, on staging. And that feature also allows you to get density or dense workloads in your, in your, in your data center or in the cloud. So if you don't know what I mean by that, I've built a slide to kind of illustrate that. The left-hand side of this slide illustrates kind of the old world. We've got a hypervisor and a couple of VMs running on it. And the VMs are color-coded for uh, indicating what dependencies they have on them, okay? And in the center here, you've got these applications that are color-coded to determine what, what dependencies they require. So you can see the dark green apps can run nicely on the VM that has the dark green dependencies installed on it, and the slightly slight, uh, lighter green can run on those. But I have all these apps sitting in the center that can't run anywhere. And maybe these two servers, these two VMs up here, maybe they're only running at 10% CPU, 10% uh, memory, but yet I've got all these unused workloads here. So if you look really closely there, you're going to have to look really closely. I put a very thin line <laughs> around those boxes to indicate that they're now containerized. Okay, and what that means is that the dependencies are now encapsulated inside of those containers, and so now they can all run on any server that has a container engine running on it. So now maybe this guy's running at 60, 70 percent capacity. And that's the attribute of dependency encapsulation of the containers. They enable that functionality. 
So let's take a quick demo on developing locally to uh, uh, developing uh, these fast data solutions locally. So if you take a look in here, you can see I've run a Docker PS. I've got Kafka up and running, OK? And you can also see that I've just done a list of my, uh, of my networks, OK? Now, the easiest way for me to run up Cassandra is for me to just uh, run a Docker container. So what I've done is if you, uh, if you want to run any of this code that you're going to see later, the producer, the lag reader, the consumer, any of that stuff, all this code is out on my GitHub. It's out here at. It's out here at github.com, whack, rob, bag, VD, COS, Kafka, Cassandra. Okay. What I've got here under docs is also some nice uh, guidance on how to run both Cassandra and Kafka uh, containerized. Because there's a ton of articles out there, and they all kind of drive you in different directions. It's actually kind of a bit painful to do. But it talks about the, the, why we need to set up a, a, a network, and then gives me the command to run either Docker for Windows or on Linux. So I'm just going to go ahead and just copy this command. And I'm going to run it. See, now I'm running because. Uh, ah, I guess we guess we'll have to skip uh, skip the local demo. Uh, oh. Uh, Or not. We can just not panic. OK, so now Cassandra's up and running. So uh, you can either trust me, or as my father told me when I left for college, trust no one. So if some of you are like my father and you're not going to trust me, I've, got, I've written a little utility to illustrate how you can, uh, how you can uh, uh, read and write to Cassandra. So if you go back out to that little help page that I've got, you can see I've got a test container. It's a little Cassandra tester. And I'll show you the code in a second. But let's just run it up. The Cassandra tester is up and running. OK, if we take a look, we've got our little uh, Cassandra tester. And if I do it, Docker logs. You can see that every three seconds, it's going to be writing a message. And then it's going to be reading a message back, uh, reading the last 10 events back from Cassandra. Right? So I've got Cassandra up and running. Now, let's go ahead and stop this. Now. When I'm working with Cassandra, I want to work locally. So I want to use all the tools that I'm, I'm normally using. If you took a look at the uh, Cassandra, the Docker run, you can see that I mapped port 9042. Uh, let's take a look here. You can see right here that I mapped port 9042 on my host down to 9042 in the container. The benefit of that is I can use anything like uh, DataStax Dev Center to just directly connect to my local machine, open the connection, and then I can just start running and developing against that c cluster. Make sense? OK, so now I've got Cassandra running. I've got Kafka up and running locally. And I want to start building my fast data solution. Remember, I've got my producer that's writing events to Kafka, consumer that's reading, and it's also writing out to uh, another lag. And then I've got a lag reader. So all that code, again, is out of that GitHub. I've got it locally here. You can see the consumer, the producer, and the lag reader. And I've got a Docker Compose file. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you that. The Docker Compose file has got the producer, consumer, the lag reader. You can run Docker build against it, Docker Compose build, build it, run it. So let's just go ahead and run this thing. Docker Compose, up, minus F, or excuse me, minus D, run it as a daemon. And we're going to spin up. My reader, my producer, so we can do a Docker. And I can do a Docker logs. And I can do my uh, code producer. And you can see that I'm publishing those messages locally to Kafka. Docker logs. And I can do my consumer. You can see that. I'm reading those, and I'm writing out to Kafka to that separate uh, to that separate topic, and then I can do over to my 
lag reader. And you can see the lags are going to start growing. They're growing to 3,400, 34, et cetera. They're going to continually grow. And so I can actually go ahead and, and use Docker Compose. And I can do a scale. And I can scale my consumer up. And I can push that out. And I can show, while developing locally, how I'm able to uh, handle the scaling and make sure that all my code is working, my lag reader is working appropriately, right? All of that, and if we watched, if we watched the logs on the, uh, on the lag reader, uh, you'd start to see those slowly come down. So as you can see, from a container perspective, I'm, I'm able to develop locally. But I'm not going to want to scale across my single node using Docker Compose, am I? And that's the role of the orchestrator. So let's jump back to the slides and take a look and see how we can take advantage of the orchestrator to solve, uh, to solve really running at scale, not just and moving past the development side. Okay? So when you're running at scale, that's the, the role of the orchestrator. Is to, and if you look at the orchestrators, they all tend to generally solve the same set of problems. If you look at uh, Mesos and DCOS, Docker Swarm, you look at Kubernetes, they all tend to act as kind of a kernel for, uh, for a cluster of machines. You don't have to worry about where to schedule a, a specific service. You basically declare the service has these requirements and the orchestrator will find somewhere to run it. It can do health checks both at the process both, both at the process as well as into the application. And when that application's not running healthy, it can reschedule that and restart it, right? It allows you to scale not only across one machine, but off a, uh, across a cluster. Allows you to gain resiliency and high availability by scaling across fault domains. All of the orchestrators tend to, to, to do those same things. So what is it that's special about DCOS? How, it's really specifically when we start talking about building these fast data solutions. The answer, if you sat through the, the keynote this morning, Eriex really, uh, really hit home on that. It's these vetted stateful frameworks. What are, they, what are they? Well, they're really distributed applications. They've got the notion of a, a controller and workers. They're called a scheduler and an executor. And the benefit is, is the scheduler is both application and cluster aware. So it can make application-based decisions on how to run that application given what's going on in the cluster. If you've ever installed something like Cassandra or Kafka yourself, you'll know that it's non-trivial to do. That is all encapsulated inside of those frameworks. So not only the installation, understanding what the dependency tree is. I need to make sure X is installed before Y. This is all up and running. Not only, not only beyond running or understanding getting an HA implementation of these frameworks running, they go beyond that. So if you want to do things like add a node into Cassandra, that's, again, a non-trivial operation without these frameworks. All of that and more, I've got a little bit of an eye chart up here to illustrate to you the benefit of uh, or some of the benefits that are uh, in the Cassandra framework. You can, look at, you can look at each of these, but they really should hopefully illustrate to you really the power of running these. They're not templates. It's not like a Helm chart that you're running that's going to install uh, on Kubernetes because of the fact that it's, it's an application that's aware of, uh, of its surroundings as well as the app itself. So hopefully we've beaten that down. Now, if you want to run these frameworks on DCOS and you want to do it in Azure, there are a couple ways to install it. One, you can just go into our portal, go into the marketplace, search on Mesosphere. I'll show you that in a second. Another way to do it is through something called ACS Engine. In, in Azure, the way we deploy is something called an ARM template. Azure Resource Manager templates. It's a big giant thing adjacent, big ball adjacent, that defines the topology of what you want. Okay? You can use ACS Engine, which is an open source project. I'll show that to you in a second. It's a little Go app where you create this little tiny template, and you run it against ACS Engine, and it gives you that ARM template, and you just deploy it. Okay? And that allows you to define custom topologies for DCOS. So you can say, maybe I want two private pools. Or maybe I want to deploy into, a cut, into, a, into an existing virtual network because I want to build a hybrid solution. Or maybe I want to have attached disks for storage, like me. So you'd use ACS Engine to do that. And I'll give you a high level on how to do that in a little bit. That's the Azure pitch, right? OK, so we talked about the orchestrators. We talked about specifically DCOS and the power of DCOS. Now I want to talk to you about data persistence, OK? 
And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about how Portworks is going to solve some of the challenges that we have within data persistence. So let's talk about the options for container persistence. I'm going to talk to you about Azure ones in specific, but most of these can be generalized to uh, other clouds or even on-prem. The first one is Azure specific. It's Azure Files, which is a, a, a file sharing service. You might think Azure Files is your answer for if you're going to run Cassandra, Kafka for your persistence. The challenge is that it wasn't designed for that. It's a file share designed for a specific files, not for high IOPS. It's highly throttled, and if you're running something like Cassandra, you, you're, you're going to get throttled, and it's just not going to work for you. So you don't want to use Azure Files. Next solution, you could use the ephemeral disks on the VM. And there are people that do that. We've got people that want to eke out that last bit of performance in Cassandra, and they run on the ephemeral disks knowing that if the node dies, they lose, the, the, they lose everything on that node, right? But they take that into account with their backup strategy and their snapshotting strategy. You can do that, but that's, that is for a highly advanced scenario where you need to eke out that last bit of uh, performance. It's not a generalized use. So then you've got attached disks, and that's probably the most common use that you have. And I'll talk to you about attached disks in more uh, detail in just one second. Then you've got pooled storage solutions. And what pooled storage does typically is you take a bunch of maybe attached disks, and then you aggregate all those together, and then you serve out virtual volumes. And I'll talk to you about how, uh, how these pooled storage solutions, some examples are Portworks, GlusterFS, how those pooled software solutions or pooled storage solutions solve some of the problems that you're going to see with attached disks. So with that, let's talk about the challenges of attached disks. The first challenge I think of when talking about attached disks has to do with container rescheduling. If you're looking down at your PC, you're missing about 30 minutes of work on, a, uh, on an animation on this slide. So everybody look up. Let's respect the animation. All right. So when a node gets scheduled to node 1, it needs to get rescheduled to node 2. What happens with that disk? The disk is going to have to move from node 1 to node 2. Or you're going to have to, you can look down at your PCs again. The cool animation's done for now. I'll let you know when the next one's coming. Or you're going to have to make sure that that uh, work gets rescheduled on the same node. Now, if the node was the problem, that's not going to work. So you've got this disk movement problem. What's the challenge when the disk moves? Even if the orchestrator can tell the disk, detach from here and attach from over here, you've got latency. That's a moving part, right? The second challenge is this relationship. I call it the container disk challenge. It's this relationship you have between the containers and the disks. If two containers are writing to the same disk, naturally, if you have to reschedule it, you would have to reschedule both of those because you've got to move the disk, right? Or you've got to enforce a one-to-one -one relationship. What's the problem with the one-to-one -one relationship? Well, the one-to-one -one relationship causes a couple problems. One, you may have a max number of disks that you can attach per VM. But secondly, it's not a very granular unit. You might say that, oh, I want a 5 gig disk uh, for uh, container one, right? What if you need to go to 10, dig 10 gigs? Well, over provision. Well, maybe now you're paying for something you don't need. It's not, it's not the best solution. There are challenges there. And so some of those challenges are addressed by these pooled software solutions. So in this slide, what you see is I've got two nodes, and those nodes have four disks attached to each of them. Each of those disks is 128 gig. The pool storage is going to take those and aggregate that into a terabyte. And so when node 1 wants to spin up container 1, container 1 needs a 10 gig volume, that pooled solution is going to give you a virtual volume of 10 gigs. If it needs to be 15, Voila, it's 15. If it needs to get rescheduled, the container needs to get rescheduled to node 2. No animations here, by the way. If it needs to get rescheduled to node 2, then voila, no disk movement. That's the benefit. So what am I using as this pooled storage solution? I'm using Portworks. Okay? Portworks is a, is a great solution. Not only does it kind of solve those problems I just mentioned for, uh, for pooling, and giving out virtual volumes, but it was built and designed for containers. So it has a lot of per container functionality. Things like the ability to uh, encrypt per volume. So you get basically container by container encryption by bringing your own keys. You get a Docker volume driver. And so the orchestrator, as it's basically saying, hey, I need this, uh, I need this bit of compute, this container scheduled over here, can also call into the volume driver 
to get a volume. And so you're treating storage the exact same way that you're treating your containers. You also get enterprise features such as backups and snapshots. So I don't want to beat on, on the, uh, uh, I don't want to beat the drum for Portworks too hard. Jeff's here from Portworks. He'll be out in the hall. If you want to talk to Jeff or the other folks, um, please do. Um, they'll talk to you about it. Let's, let's do a demo now about running at scale. So basically what I, what I want to do in this demo is I just want to show you how in a DCOS cluster I can get Cassandra up and running using Portworks on the back end. And then in the last demo, I'll show you running the entire app and then scaling it. Good? Okay. So. I basically created a little test cluster here. Okay, it's a three-node cluster. It's got Portworks running across three nodes. Okay, and I've got something called Reproxy. The Portworks UI is in, sitting in the private agent pool, so I need Reproxy in order to uh, serve, serve that out. Okay, so I've got that running. You can see Lighthouse out here. Because Cassandra takes a little while to deploy, I'm going to go ahead and deploy that now, and then I'll kind of backtrack and talk to you a little bit about it. So I'm going to just search for Cassandra, and I'm going to install the Portworks Cassandra uh, framework. And the reason why I'm choosing the Portworks uh, Cassandra framework and not the, uh, the other Cassandra framework is that this has the volume driver integrated in it. So I'm just going to put a two nodes out here. And while this thing's installing, one thing you'll notice is as this thing starts to deploy, you're going to start seeing that kind of dependency tree illustrated out here. You're going to start seeing things are going to get deployed in order. And that's illustrating what I was talking about, the value of the scheduler. But as this, thing, as this thing gets deployed, let's take a look at Lighthouse. So this is the UI for Portworks. You can see I had a three-node cluster with 128 gig attached disk on each node. But you can see to Portworks, it's aggregated at the 384 gig. You can see I've got three nodes. They're all running. But I've got no storage. No volumes have been served out yet. But what you'll, if we watch this for a second, as that scheduler starts to kick out my Cassandra nodes, and don't worry about the big red line. I didn't uh, configure an email server, so uh, whatever. Uh, but oh, there you can see it now. So the first node for Cassandra's up. When the second node comes up, you're going to see another 10 gig volume is going uh, to be handed out. I didn't do anything. The orchestrator is controlling all this. And that shows you the value of, uh, of, that, uh, of that volume driver. So we're going to let Cassandra run for a little bit. Uh, the install run because there's still a second node that needs to get going. I'm going to take a quick break over to ACS Engine and show you how you might install uh, a cluster. I'm just going to give you the high level here, and in, but uh, hopefully it'll give you enough to go on if you want to in Azure. So you got to github.com, whack Azure, whack ACS Engine. And if you go into docs, and inside of docs under acsengine.md, you can basically see it'll give you the uh, install instructions of installing ACS Engine. What, in general, what you do, the easiest way to install it is either to, uh, either to run it inside of Docker, easiest way to do it, or you can just grab the binaries under the releases. Grab those binaries, and what you do is, if you go into ACS Engine, you can see these examples. So under the examples, these are these little mini templates that, uh, these little templates that you have to fill out that you run against ACS Engine. So you call ACS Engine, generate, and you pass it one of these templates. In this case, I use this template. So I've got DCOS. I've chosen I want one master. I entered in my DNS prefix, and then I, uh, I chose one, uh, one disk, 128 gig, and I entered in my public key. Okay? I ran that against it. I got an ARM template, and then I deployed that ARM template. Okay? That's Essentially, as simple as it is, is depl in deploying uh, an ACS, uh, ACS cluster. Okay. So now you can see Cassandra's, I've just got served up my second volume, so I can see that Cassandra's up and running. So I've got two nodes in Cassandra up and running. Well, this one's staging. So I'll wait till that finishes up. And then what I can do is I can get that Cassandra tester. We can run it up here and just prove that that runs. And then we'll jump back to the slides very briefly. And then I'll show you how we can, uh, can auto-scale this thing. So everything's up and running. Let's grab that auto tester. I just happen to have the marathon config for my auto tester. So I take that. I go into DCOS services. I add my little auto tester, Cassandra tester. Here's Cassandra tester. It's going to deploy quite quickly. That little thing starts to buzz when I lie. Did you notice that? 
or when I'm about to lie. So let's click on it. Still staging. Let's give it a second. It only takes this long if you're on stage. And it takes longer if there are more people in the audience. With for every 20 people, it's another 10 seconds. Okay, so I've been running. We can click on, and I lost my mouse. So we can click on here, take a look at the logs. Now, Cassandra's taking a little bit longer. I'll, I'll kind of jump back into this a little bit later if we have time. But Cassandra's uh, not uh, properly up completely yet, so it's, it's taking a minute. So I'll jump back to this in a little bit, but let me just uh, let me pop into the slides and keep going, because we, we want to get to the money part of this demo, which is the VAMP, uh, the VAMP solution. So what we want to do next is talk about kind of the, the next day. So hopefully I've illustrated uh, the ease of which you can install Cassandra, uh, the w ease of which you can take advantage of uh, uh, pooling solutions such as Portworx to handle those persistence problems. So now what we want to do is talk about day two. Uh, again, if you missed the talks by Tim and by Julian uh, on VAMP earlier, one of them is uh, running DevOps, the other one was just on VAMP, um, highly urge you to watch those recordings. They're unbelievable presentations. They talk about Canary deployments and all of the power of VAMP from a Canary uh, deployment perspective. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, VAMP from the perspective of using it to do microscaling. So what is VAMP? If you didn't see those solutions, it's a canary releasing and auto-scaling for microservices uh, systems. Basically what they do is they take a bunch of telemetry out of the orchestrator, and they make that telemetry available to you inside of workflows. Okay? That's the, the simplest way to think about it. It's, they've got these constructs that represent the artifacts that you want. So I've got containers, those are uh, in, in workflows and all of that, and they're encapsulated in these constructs. But the real money is you've got all of these, uh, you've got this set of rich set of data, which is, uh, includes data that's coming from the orchestrators, but also data that you can push in yourself from your application. So you can push this data onto what you can think of as a bus, and then you can write workflows that operate against that, which is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that lag, that aggregate lag that tells me how far behind I am in Kafka, I'm going to push that into VAMP. And then I'm going to write a workflow that says, hey, if my aggregate lag is greater than 500 and I've got less than 10 consumers running, spin up another consumer. I'm going to do that every 15 seconds. But if my aggregate lag is less than 100 and I've got more than one instance, spin it back down. So eventually I should level set, given my rudimentary uh, algorithm. Make sense? I've got to explain to you a couple artifacts in VAMP so you understand it from a high level, but I don't have to go into too much detail. Uh, breeds, they're basically described entities. So uh, you can think of them as like a marathon JSON file or a YAML file inside of Kubernetes. Just defines the entity. Uh, a blueprint is a topology. It really typically has several entities. So if my blueprint is going to have my lag reader, my consumer, and my producer. Make sense? Don't you hate it when a guy says, makes sense? I can't stop saying it now. And then you've got deployments. A deployment is just a blueprint that's running. Okay? And then you've got workflows. And a workflow is just a little Node.js application deployed as a container that runs against that telemetry, either orchestrator telemetry, or you can run it against your own custom telemetry, which I'm going to. So why don't we just take a look at a demo? Let's see if my, uh, if my Cassandra tester is working yet. There you go. My Cassandra tester is up and running. So Cassandra is up and running. I actually didn't write such a crap component that I normally write it, retried. So I should get a little clap for that. I'll give myself, yes! No crap code here. Um, there's a lot of crap code here, by the way. All right, so I'm going to close this out. And I'm going to close out this session, and I'm going to go ahead and connect to another cluster. You guys ever see the movie Dumb and Dumber? where he says, just when I think you couldn't write or do something any dumber, you do that and totally redeem yourself. Hopefully, I totally redeem myself. All right. So I'm connected to another cluster. Let's take a look at it. I'm doing port forwarding, by the way. That's why I'm on localhost. So you can see... This cluster got a bunch of stuff running. I got Portworx and Reproxy again. 
for my back end. I've got Kafka and Cassandra both running. Both of those are the Portworks, uh, the Portworks uh, versions that have the Portworks volume driver. Um, I've also got VAMP running and Elasticsearch. So uh, VAMP is using Elasticsearch for its time series data. Okay? So VAMP, if we take a look here, click into it, there's a little group here. And the most important guy here is the UI. Actually, the most important guy is the API. But for the purpose of this demo, the most important guy is the API, uh, the UI. So if we pop into here and we take a look at the breeds, you can see I've got a breed for my producer. And if we take a look at that, you can see that really all this thing is, is it, it, it's basically defining my entity. And the real money there is that it's pointing to uh, inside of Docker Hub is a container, our Bagby WAC demo producer, right? And that's got a bunch of environment variables, and those variables can either get overridden by the, uh, can either get overridden by the blueprint, um, or uh, if, you're, if you're calling into the API, you can override it, okay? So I've got my producer, my lag reader, and my consumer. And then I've got a blueprint that's my ready demo here, right? And so my ready demo, you can see it's got the breed for my producer, and I can override those environment variables there. Can you guys see this well enough without me zooming in? Yeah. Uh, the consumer, the details don't really matter too much, and my producer. So I've got this blueprint. I can run this thing up, OK? So let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to deploy it. Now remember I told you that we're going to get all these events when this thing deploys. So you can see we're starting to deploy here. And this thing's going to go ahead and try and deploy those three containers into DCOS. And when the lag reader gets up and running and it starts calculating the aggregate lag, I'm actually writing that back to the VAMP API. So I should be able to see in these events my aggregate lag. I'm going to get rid of the health and the metrics and the allocation events. And we should God, keep missing it. We should start seeing some lag events popping up. If I go over here back to DCOS and take a look in services, you can see my services are running. So I've got my producer up and running. If we take a look at the logs, you can see my producer's pushing 50 messages every second. If I go back to the services, you can see that all my services are up and running and the lag readers out there pushing those lag events. And let's see where it's pushing them to. You can see it's out here pushing. One was 294.33. If we go back to VAMP, you can see I've got all those lag events are getting pushed into VAMP. Now, I've written a workflow that, just like I told you, let's take a look at it. So let's go into the breeds. Let's hide these events for a second. Look at the breeds and look at my auto scale. And here's the workflow. And I'll just show you the money bit here. Oops. OK, so here we go. What you can see here is. I've basically got the events in HTTP GET to my URI to uh, VAMP running in the cluster uh, to the events where the tag is lag. So it's basically just getting my lag events back. I'm then getting those back past me as a response. And then I'm just running this logic. If the lag is greater than 500 and the scale of my, in my instance count is less than 10, scale the instances. Otherwise, if it's less than 100, scale them down. Make sense? So let's run this thing. Let's take a look at my events and see where my lags are. My lags are over 500 now. So when I kick this thing off, it should immediately start pushing these things out. So there's my auto scale ready workflow. And let's start it. And this thing's going to run for every 15 seconds. It's going to run. So let's just watch it go. While this thing's kicking, you can see it just ran. It didn't do anything because my lag is 458. Remember, that lag can kind of go up and down artificially because it only uh, it there are certain nodes or uh, partitions that it's not reading off. But eventually, we'll hit over 500, and this thing will kick off. And when it does, we're going to see my instance count go up. And we're going to instantly see, here we go, we're now up to two instances. Can you all see that? Two instances popping up. If we go back to DCOS and look at it, you can basically see uh, the services. You can see I'm now deploying my second instance out here. Let's take a look in DCOS just at kind of the, uh, the density that we're running at. And you should see it start move up higher than this as we start deploying more and more services. And as VAMP starts seeing these things going up, you can see my lag is starting to, uh, is starting to increase rather drastically. Because as I spin up new consumers, they're hitting different uh, partitions that were never being read off before. So all of a sudden, it says, oh, partition X now has 
50 or 100 or 500. And eventually this thing will uh, start moving up and you'll start seeing all of the, once we uh, have 10 consumers out there, you're going to have basically a clarity on what your entire lag was. And eventually we'll move, we'll move back, down to, uh, back down to below 100 because my consumers will now catch up and we'll start moving down. So it'll eventually smooth itself down to somewhere around between four and five, uh, four and five containers. Make sense? There it is. That makes sense again. I can't stop saying it. So let's take one more look over here at DCOS. We can see that we've got now six running. We're trying to deploy the seventh. And if we go into the nodes, you can start seeing that we're actually getting higher and higher density. So it's the container, the fact that it encapsulates its dependencies, allows it to run anywhere. But it's the orchestrator that allows you to schedule it anywhere. But now it's this workflow component that gives you the ease of use of spinning them up and spinning them down upon need or upon use. The benefit is that you have workflows, or if you have work items that vary throughout the day, you can spin up containers for the ones that need more, spin down for others that don't, and you can really kind of not have to worry about what's what I call macro scaling, scaling up nodes as much as you do just spinning up and down workloads inside of those uh, existing clusters. So let's just go ahead and back to VAMP for a second here. And we'll just keep it on here as the, uh, as the lag starts to go down. We're sitting here at, uh, I think we've got 9 or 10. The lag will eventually start going down. As it goes down below 100, this thing will, uh, the, the, they'll start to spin back down. But for now, why don't I take any questions, if we have any? And then we've got a microphone here. Um, and if they're Portworx related, uh, again, the Portworx guys are out there. Um, and we've also got somebody from VAMP here that can answer higher level VAMP questions. One back here. <coughs> First of all, thank for the talk. Uh, maybe it's a poor works uh, question, but uh, as uh, we are talking about uh, fast uh, application, mm, how do you measure the delay of waiting in a in a scalable data store? In a distributed data, in a pooled uh, data store that you. Can, can I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, when I work with this kind of technologies, one of the most important parts is the data locality. So, if you write or read from a pooling data store, how do you measure this this delay of the writing of the and the reading from uh, the from each of the components? Yes. How do you measure the delay on yes, reading? because we are talking about fast application. So I, mean, I assume that th all of this is, is, is in a microsecond uh, uh, scale. So do you measure this delay or this is or uh, this currently in, in this In this app, I'm not, uh, I'm not doing that. But we can, uh, we can take that offline if you want. And I can kind of direct you to some people that can probably help you from that perspective. Well, that's it. If you've got patience for just another couple of seconds, we've just hit below the 100 threshold, and we should see this thing start to scale back. But that's it. Uh, and uh, thanks for attending. And we scaled down to nine.